Today's show is sponsored by Datadog, a cloud scale monitoring platform that unifies metrics, logs, and traces from technologies like Istio, AppMesh, and Envoy. Plus, Datadog's service map automatically plots out the dependencies in your microservices architectures for seamless, context rich troubleshooting. With rich visualizations, algorithmic alerting, and more than 250 vendor support integrations, Datadog allows you to monitor your distributed applications in real time. Start a free 14 day trial today by visiting datadog.com slash cloudcast and Datadog will send you a great free t-shirt. That's datadog.com slash cloudcast. Cloudcast Media presents, from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hope everybody is doing well. We are midway through October. We are continuing to cruise along into fall. So I hope everybody is staying well, staying safe, uh, keeping your friends and colleagues and family uh, safe and and doing everything you can. And uh, if you're here in the States, hopefully you get a chance to get out there and vote, uh, exercise your your right to your democracy. So uh, with that, let's get right to Cloud News of the Week. There are lots and lots of of, of money flowing around today in Cloud News of the Week. Uh, First and foremost, Twilio acquired Segment for $3.2 billion. Uh, Twilio, who has uh, been a guest on the show, really extremely well known for uh, making developers lives simpler as they add communication tools to their applications uh, acquired segment segment very much um, you know kind of doing the uh, interconnect to lots and lots of data sources so kind of a kind of a salesforce sort of play here um, you know Twilio stock has been way way up they had the opportunity to start spending some of that uh, that equity and uh, so big uh, big play here for Twilio acquiring segment and I think I, I saw somebody saying uh, yeah I think I saw the folks from Redmonk saying this uh, this feels like them doing kind of a kind of a Salesforce play sort of a Salesforce marketplace type of thing so interesting to watch uh, you know simplicity of developer uh, things happening second cloud news that we kind of related um, cloud communication platform Message Bird raised two hundred million dollars at a three billion dollar valuation uh, for those of you that don't know Message Bird kind of a an up and comer trying to uh, to challenge Twilio, so going after a lot of the same communication sort of space, developer integrated communication tools. So interesting to see that space kind of explode for what looks like uh, you know several billion dollars of either valuation or actual money being spent. And then finally, a local company here, Raleigh, uh, some uh, here in Raleigh, uh, Bandwidth, Bandwidth.com, uh, acquired international cloud communications leader Voxbone for 446 million euros. So whatever that is in dollars, probably like 18 trillion or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's uh, a great company, um, has always done really well in terms of uh, – uh, broadband here in the states, uh, you know, voice communication, IP communication over the top of that, and obviously with so many people working from home, uh, you know, the ability to get bandwidth and, and IP services uh, expands, and so they are expanding internationally. So always cool to see a uh, local company doing well, and obviously they are a uh, global company as well, but they just happen to be here in the Raleigh area, so we're always excited to see that happen. So excited for them. Um, with that, I'm going to wrap up Cloud News of the Week. We kind of, you know, like I said, lots of money flowing, which is always cool. Uh, uh, see the economy, <clears throat> see the uh, the industry doing well in terms of investment. Um, we are going to get back to technology. The last couple of weeks, we've had a chance to sort of learn some new stuff. We, we dug into streaming with Chris, uh, with Chris Short. Uh, we dug into uh, you know some diversity and, and issues of women in color and in, uh, in tech with uh, with Suzanne Tedrick last week. Hopefully, you had a chance to dig into both those really fun shows, chance to learn some new stuff, chance to um, you know help be a better ally and help uh, diversify our communities, give some people an opportunity. And this week, we're going to dive back into the tech, kind of as we've we've always gotten back to our roots. We're going to look at uh, something we've wanted to do for a long time, which is the Jam Stack. So, whoa, Jam! We are getting into the Jam Stack. We're going to talk to the folks from uh, Netlify about Jam right after the break. Today's show is sponsored by BMC. And BMC wants to know, is your business on its A-game? The A-game is when systems are intelligent by learning from markets, where automation is paramount yet effortless, and when technology and people work as one in an enterprise. The A-game is your business at its absolute best. BMC calls this the autonomous digital enterprise. Find out more at bmc.com slash A-game. That's bmc.com slash A-game. Today's show is sponsored by Cloud Academy. Listen up, y'all. This is a great offer. With everyone using the same cloud platforms, winning and losing comes down to having the best talent to build products better and faster. Cloud Academy is the training platform of choice for Fortune 500 companies and thousands of tech professionals around the world. Thousands of video courses, learning paths, practical hands-on labs in real-world cloud environments, Cloud Academy has tools designed to help teams assess, 
build, and validate critical cloud skills. Most importantly, Cloud Academy stays agile, challenging you with new content, labs, and tons of features that ensure your skills stay relevant and everyone can level up. They cover everything from cloud certifications to DevOps to security to programming languages. You can get started now at cloudacademy.com. For a limited time, Cloudcast listeners can lock in 50% off the monthly price for life. Just put in the coupon code CLOUDCAST at checkout. It's a great way to pursue certifications or just build cloud expertise. Again, that's cloudacademy.com and use the coupon code CLOUDCAST to lock in 50% off the monthly price. And we're back. And folks, you know, as you know, we've uh, we've covered things like serverless uh, quite a bit over the years. We know that uh, there's always been a big um, interest in, in the serverless topic. And, you know, we've always tried to cover, you know, certain trends that happen around uh, around application development, especially in the domain of where, you know, new technologies have come along to make things easier for developers, right? There's always lots of ways to make life difficult for developers, but anything that makes life easier for developers is always worth digging into and and really looking at sort of when new trends come along, um, you know, how can they be taken advantage of by developers to make your life easier, please your customers, make you more productive. And so very excited today to really dig into a topic that we've been kind of keeping our eye on for a little while, uh, but we really get a chance today to, to really dig into it. So very excited to have Matt Bielman, who is the co-founder and CEO of Netlify. Uh, Matt, welcome to the show. Glad to have you on. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're going to kind of dig into um, a little bit of Netlify, but also uh, the Jamstack, which is something that you guys have been pioneering. Before we dive into that, uh, you've been spending a lot of your, uh, probably the last decade or so, really trying to make the web simpler for people. So for anybody who doesn't know you or doesn't know uh, doesn't know the company. Give us a little bit of your background and, and kind of how you got so passionate about this space. Yeah, I've been in, in been in the space of building tools for web developers for for a very long time. Um, I spent a I spent a while in in Spain before I came to to the Bay Area, where I worked as a CTO for a company that 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 built websites for small to medium businesses, but at a very large scale. So we were building something like a uh, hundred websites a week, tens of thousands of of, of sites in total, right and yeah, I, I I led the whole product and engineering organization that built the platform that designers would use to de- do design with and clients would use for content management and that powered every single website from initial brief to production. And it was really about like how, how do we build like the most efficient way of, of, of building custom made websites uh, at, at scale. So based on that experience, I, I started a company in Madrid um, together with this Spanish founders uh, I worked with before to build like a, a cloud hosted platform um, to give other developers and other professionals some of the same efficiencies when 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 they were working uh, on building sites for their clients. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what initially brought me sort of to the Bay Area and started getting involved in this whole ecosystem here and so on and, and really started seeing this this shift happening where like in, in the way front end developers work and even what it meant to be a front end developer, right? Like back back when I started out in developer tooling, a front end developer was typically more of someone that would get a PSD from a designer and then sort of slice it into HTML and CSS and then either sort of FTP into a server and, and integrate it with some templates or have a back end developer do that for them, right? And over the last time, like sort of 10 years, we've really seen this like massive change in, in what it actually means to be a front end developer and what a front end is. Um, GitHub came along and really started popularizing version control and, um, and, and, and not just for cont- like for versioning source code, but as the main sort of workflow layer and collaborative layer, uh, the browser really went from being more of a document viewer to really becoming an operating system running right. JavaScript than today even WebAssembly. And then we had like this whole explosion of, of front end built tools. Like on the one hand, the early site generators like Jekyll and so on. And on the other hand, like the whole Node.js based ecosystem around single page application frameworks that, that again, also really like introduced pretty advanced software architectures with inspiration and functional programming and OP and so on. <clears throat> to front-end developers that were now like working with version control and compiling stuff and deploying it into a, a modern browser-based operating system. So I started seeing like this 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 trend happening of um, 
the front end really getting to become its own thing that it, you would really start decoupling the front end presentation layer from from the back end and the back end itself was starting to split into all these different APIs and services where some of them are your own but a lot of them are other people's services like Stripe or Twilio or Algolia and so on right right um, and and I could see like what what that could lead to from an architecture perspective and how that could like really help us build the much better experiences for the users with better performance, better scalability and so on. Right. But the main thing holding it back was sort of like all the, all the friction involved in having to like now for every project, figure out a workflow around like a CACD pipeline and itch environment, like cache invalidation, deployment pipelines, so all of that. Right. So that was sort of the point where we really decided to to focus on building tooling that could really reduce the friction for these for this new generation of, of web developers to to build and publish. Yeah, no, that's 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 great sort of background and, and so forth. I, you know, we always love having a chance to talk to, to founders who started their company basically out of, uh, you know, having done something previously, had seen a, a, a big pain point or had seen this, you know, demand for something that they were doing internally and then went and turned it into something that could be uh, mass use. So it's very, very cool to see what you guys are, are doing. Um, l- let's let's kind of put some context around this. Um, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, we're seeing some some distribution of applications, um, you know, with Stripe or Twilio or a Lambda function or, or whatever, kind of now really impacting kind of the overall experience people have. What are what are some of the real big trends that we're seeing in terms of how people consume the web? Kind of what's what's broken now in the sort of modern world, and then you know, kind of some of the things that you guys are really doing to to make that better, make it more scalable, easier to use. Yeah, of course. Like in general, the the amount of people consuming things on the web has just like um, exploded over the over the last couple of decades, right? Right. Um, and the amount of devices used to consuming the web has 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 exploded, right? And we're dealing with a very big gap of people between like people on on very slow connections in remote areas, so people on very high bandwidth connections in central areas, very different types of devices. Some are very compute uh, like capable, and some are very uh, light, and so on. Um, and I think initially when that started happening we started seeing like some reactions that that started leading people away from the open independent web right like the the sort of classical example was that when the iphone launched the idea was that the app store would actually just be html5 applications right and and uh, and that would be what people ran on their phone but at the time it quickly became clear that that the way we built for the web didn't make for the right level of, of performance and, and experience that users wanted on their phone, right? Like, so that sort of started leading to, to the different app stores and native applications. And then we started seeing reactions like Facebook building out instant pages and uh, Google starting EMP and so on, right? That's all sort of based on a perceived lack of, of, of performance and, and responsiveness on, on the web used in many ways as an excuse to, to drive people out of an open independent ecosystem and into different kind of walled gardens, right? Right. So what we thought was essential was that it had to be really easy for, for, for developers to build really engaging experiences on the web that that could deliver the same kind of, of, of performance um, and, um, and and that could like Tip the tip the scale back towards uh, the the open and independent web, and some some of the elements in that was like this idea of like traditionally when we built web applications, we built them all around this um, idea of sort of a request and response cycle with a application server that would run a program every time you made a request and talk to a database and then build something for you and send it back, right? And we thought like, can we can we change that model so we always try to see everything we can pre-build whenever a piece of content change and when it, or whenever like the source code change, can we pre-build all of that and then package it up and distribute it on um, a global network of, of edge nodes that are really close to the user. So we can get like that initial snappiness of like you go to a, to a URL and you get something in front of you very quickly. 
like can we make that sort of the default way of working so so everything is fast by default and and what you do after that is is sort of like you you have to actually work to make things slower right right so yeah. that was one of the initial ideas behind the Jamstack. Like, how can we make that that process of of pre building up front and and doing global distribution really straightforward, right? Right. And right. then, of course, you start having like the next set. Okay, so the things that you can't pre build up front, like there, you might need to talk to different APIs and services. How can we make the process of talking to these different APIs and services, of gluing them together, of writing the the, the microservice endpoints you need between them. How can we make that really simple to work with and really easy to to test and distribute and so on, uh, and also give it the same kind of like infinite scalability as as you have from like the pre built uh, assets. So that's where like the, this whole idea of serverless functions also came in and started becoming like an integral part of the of the technology stack. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and, I, and I think you, you really hit on on probably the most important aspect of that, which is, you know, we have this psychological thing where once start once things start getting faster for us, the response times start getting faster. You know, we, we start having this internal clock in our head that's like, I expect everything to be that way. Right. And, and we see it yeah. with our, we see it with our kids. We see it with teenagers. It's like they want everything right now all the time, no matter what bandwidth they have, no matter what that is. And um, so yeah, you know, being able to to address that um, is is really critical. Let's talk a little bit about the Jamstack because as I kind of dig into it and try and learn it, um, you know, I I have this tendency to to try and go, okay, you know, put this into like something else that you know. Um, do, when you talk about it, do you obviously it's um, you know kind of per the name, it's a it's a stack of technologies, but do you think about it as sort of a you know kind of a new language? Do you think of it as a framework? Is it I mean, obviously, there's there's some really big architectural I, differences between you know old ways of doing CMSs. Like, how do you kind of explain it to people? I generally think of it as an architectural approach, mm-hmm. right? Like, and I think there could be some confusion of it being called a stack, right? Because um, previously, when we had like the LAMP stack and so right. on, what defined it was a very specific set of technologies, right? Like Linux and Apache and your MySQL database and right. PHP as your programming language, right? Um, what we are trying to capture with the with the name Jamstack was this sense that the stack has moved up a level, right? Like now it's actually more about like the browser and all these different APIs and services that, that you can talk to, and then like a runtime in the browser as the main dynamic language that that ties everything together. And it became like more of a way of of describing an an architecture an architectural principle than a specific tech stack, right? Because there's a lot of freedom in in the technologies involved, right? Um, at the build layer, you can like there there are site generation raters or single page frameworks or bundlers in in all kinds of programming languages, and there's a very rich landscape of of open source tools and frameworks there, right? On the API side of things, it's more about like before we would have like monolithic platforms like WordPress or Ruby on Rails, and they would have a set of plugins that were sort of internal to them, right? Now we sort of gone and, and, and we have this whole world of, of APIs and services where some you can self-host and they're open source and other are managed services like Stripe or Twilio or Algolia. Um, but there's just this whole like, API economy at your hands for for a lot of the functionalities that before you would go to like an integrated plugin and and today you would go and say okay I need search I'll 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 simply connect to to Algolia and and now I have it I need subscription I'll I'll simply connect to Stripe and and now I have it right yeah no it, it's it, it is really interesting to like you said architecturally once you start breaking down the idea that, um, you know, all of your content doesn't need to be local, right? You can push it out yeah. as far to the edge yeah. as possible. Um, yeah. and, and when you start with that, then it, it starts to, you know, change the way that all those other things that you thought about, uh, you know, kind of the, the, I don't know, the, the, the principles kind of break down and you go, oh, well, if I don't have to do that, I can, I can do this. I can, right. And, and then you start thinking about how do I simplify build systems? How do I, you know, start to, you know, do I do processing 
here? Do I do it at the edge? And it, yeah, you're right. It, I think if you think about it from an architecture perspective, that's the right starting point. I, obviously, that's the way you explain it, but that's that seems to be the right starting point is it, it unlocks a lot of other ways of thinking that you may not have done before. Yeah. Um, so, you know, now with the way that, that Netlify, wor- Netlify works and, uh, and, and the Jamstack work is you kind of are distributing everything out to uh, to CDNs, right? So, um, you know, obviously it's something that, that you deliver. And then you've got third-party APIs. Like, what's what's now the interaction model? Because those are living somewhere. Um, what's a typical interaction model then uh, between something you build and then these third-party services? Yeah. Um, so there's a set of different interaction points, right? Like, one is one one kind of API that's become extremely common, like to to include in this kind of architecture, is the headless CMS model, right? Where you have tools like Contentful or Sanity or um, or traditional CMSs that that used in headless mode, like uh, headless WordPress or headless Drupal, right? Um, where at build time, you will pull all the actual content that your content editors are working with and producing and then take that and use a site generator to pre-build all of the HTML pages and then push those to the edge, right? So that's one type of interaction that we see with different data sources where at at build time, you run a lot of compute and, and you have the benefits that, for example, if you run like sort of a traditional dynamically rendered site, you have to be extremely careful around how you query and how you access your content, right? Because if you construct a bad query, that query might be really slow. And now you might put l- extra load on your system for every request. And now you, you might go down once you go on, on Hacker News or whatever, right? Whereas once you move those interactions to build time, the worst thing that can happen is that your build gets a bit longer, right? But it will never have any um, user-facing consequences, right? Like everything will always be instant to users. So that's one common interaction pattern is like all the APIs and services that you talk to when you're building your, your like in, in the in the CI CD pipeline while while you're building the site, right? Then once your your site is live, you'll often see that for a lot of sort of the traditional interactive or dynamic capabilities, you start talking to a different set of APIs and services, right? Like so um Maybe during the build time, you'll also take your content catalog and then index all of it in Algolia. And then when people go to your site and they type in a word to search for, your browser will will use JavaScript to talk directly to Algolia, right? And Algolia runs their own distributed edge network with locations all over the world, right? So that interaction gets extremely fast. Um, you get the service very close to the to the actual end user, right? And you can build like very interactive and very engaging experiences around that. Um, same if you build a, a shopping cart, right? Like you might in that shopping cart pull in uh, Stripe's uh, JavaScript SDK and 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 build uh, build the check in out check checkout experience just with the browser talking directly to Stripe. Right. And okay. then there's sort of a third really common layer, right? Like let's say you go through that shopping cart experience; it's all driven in the browser. You've talked to Stripe, and now you actually want to make the payment, right? Like, to do that, like, you want to make the payment and, and, and do something for the user once they make the payment, right? Like, you should probably send them something or, or trigger a, a, a shipping action or at least create an order object somewhere, right? So there you might build a serverless function that has access to your, like, Stripe secret token, and to the other APIs that that's involved in actually like maybe sending a piece of, of like merchandise to the user or triggering like an an order or or even just sending a mail with a PF link whatever right so you might have that serverless function that now talks to Stripe as an API endpoint that talks to your different services and that and that sort of acts as the glue code between your different APIs and services. So those right now are three sort of really common, really, uh, really typical ways of interacting with these different APIs. And then a, a, a newer model that 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 we are starting to introduce is this idea of, of also being able to do things directly at the edge layer 
in the request response cycle, right? Like, so that also opens up for some interesting new possibilities. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, and it's interesting and it, it, the way you kind of walk through it. It's, it definitely sounds like we're no longer in sort of the wild west. There are well defined kind of patterns that people can can just kind of pick up on. Um, obviously, those, uh, you know, those services like like Stripe or Twilio or Algolia, like are extremely well defined. They scale well, so you're kind of matching up, um, you know, best practices for the sort of specific use case, which is which is very cool. Um, yeah, and then then yeah. on top of that, I would say we are even looking at at those patterns as they establish themselves more, and they became more sort of like, okay, this is how we solve this problem. Can we then make it as as a platform? Can we then make it even easier for developers to adopt those patterns? Right, like so that's where we've introduced tools like build plugins. And there's a good example, like Algolia. Uh, yesterday at our conference, just announced their their new build plugin, where in in where that whole pattern of saying like every time there's a deploy, we want to index it into Algolia and then make that search engine available to our front end, right? Like they've now reduced that whole plat- pattern down to two clicks, right? Like you just uh, click click twice, and now you have a build plugin installed and an Algolia search engine set up, and every time you run a build. Algolia will will index your content and and it's available for your front end, right? Like so, that's like an example of how we are thinking about like the more these patterns emerge and stabilize, the more we can also just package the package them up for developers so they can just like um, skip the step of having to write all the glue codes. Right, right, yeah, no, and that's and that's excellent. That's that's what platforms ultimately should be doing again, making it making it easier uh, for all those other functions to sort of to work together. Um, one thing I've noticed is is beginning to happen is um, obviously people know what CDNs do. They're they're distributing you know content as close to people as possible. But we're now starting to see kind of some additional functionality where it's not just distributing content, but it's actually got some some computing capabilities, some some sort of edge functionality capabilities. Talk a little yeah. bit about some of the stuff you guys are doing out on the edge now, um, and and why it's important yeah. to do that sort of work. Yeah, absolutely. Like so, already from the beginning, when we when we launched Netlify, we we sort of quickly realized that we had to build our own edge network because all the tradition the the traditional CDNs were meant for like pure content distribution, typically focused around assets and video and so on, right? And and they were all built with the idea that they would be sitting in front of an app server and then just caching specific things at the edge, right? But we wanted to get completely rid of that idea of like having your application server, right? And just saying like pre-build your front end and then push it directly to the edge. So as we did that, we also realized that there is a lot of things that you would traditionally do in the at the web server level, level right? Like mm-hmm. uh, redirects, proxying, um, maybe QIP based uh, um, rules, maybe language detection, maybe um, some levels of of simpler authentication you would do actually just at the web server level, right? Um, so when we built Netlify, we quickly realized that we had to sort like give people ways of doing these things at the edge, um, and that was one of the driving reasons for us to build our own edge network. Um, and we then gave people like a set of declarative rules for defining rewrites, redirects, uh, language based rules, all of these things, right? But then if we go deeper, there's there's even a a set of things that people would do in the request response cycle in the application server like if you're if you're doing more advanced authentication and you need to actually like take business decision based on the profile of a user if you're doing like personalization and and you want to show certain banner ads or certain products based on the on on the user that's currently logged in if there's um, functionalities that um, like a, an example we've we've heard several times have been companies that that do retail that on their website want the 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 like when a user comes in they want to see where is the user and do we have a store close to the user and if so let's show that store directly on the front page instead of sending like instead of having the the person search for it right um, and all of those things were things that you couldn't quite solve for just with declarative rules. Um, so we've been spending some time re-architecting our whole edge layer to be able to to launch what we call edge handlers, 
which is a, a like general purpose compute layer directly at the edge, uh, taking part of like the request response cycle. Um, very limited in like runtime characteristics, memory characteristics, right? Like it's meant for things that 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 run really fast um, and are typically involved in like routing decisions or response transformation or uh, API gateway like functionality, right? Um, but we are really excited about the initial response to that and 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 about like the use cases that this will unlock, especially for our larger enterprise clients, but also for the whole ecosystem that will suddenly get this kind of toolkit available uh, to integrate into frameworks and and so on. Right, right. Yeah. And it's like you said, it's, there's a certain amount of it that's, that's kind of replicating what you used to do at the web server. But then there's also a part of this, which is, um, you know, you, when you when you change the architectural model, you're like, oh, it, it it's just convenient that it's something is out there for me. I don't have to think about going to another cloud or setting up servers or, yeah, yeah. or things. So very, very yeah. cool. Yeah, that's another part of it, right? Like we, we talked to a lot of people that were using like the different providers that, that, that offers it to compute today, right? And one of the things that, that often stroke us in talking to them was that the, the whole workflows and the team's that works with the uh, edge computing providers. That's typically like, typically all all the edge logic there is written by the networking team or the DevOps team and and tied to their their workflow, right? And then there's a very different web team that works on the actual like website or front end applications or web applications, right? And the more you start coupling the edge logic to that web layer the more problematic it becomes having two very different teams, two very different cultures and two very different uh, workflows and deployment yep. pipelines for those two parts, right? Yep. And and we started hearing stories around like really painful problems emerging in, in sort of that, in all those handovers and in those gaps between those teams, right? So that's been one of the things we've really focused on. Like how can we give just like the web team one central workflow where everything lives in the same Git repository, where everything gets rolled out together, where everything can be run locally, where every pull request you you open will will give you a URL where you can view everything like in, in concert. That's been really important for us. And we think that's that's gonna be one of the things that really really makes this a game changer. Yeah, very, very cool. Hey, um, I, I want to ask you one last question, and I know this is one of those ones that uh, we're, we're sort of short on time and, and probably could go a long, a long one. You recently wrote a, uh, you wrote a blog post, um, and it was, it was kind of in response to a, a statement um, some folks from, from WordPress had made about just kind of you know, general CMS architectures. And, and I thought it was interesting for one specific thing. You said, you know, sometimes there's times in technology where like this inflection point just happens and 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 we just go in a really different direction than we were before and used kind of Steve Ballmer's comment about the iPhone yeah. being one of those. Yeah. Um, the reason, obviously, you wrote this a little bit as a response, but in your mind, like, is there something that's that's just recently happened? Maybe it's because of, you know, everybody being home for COVID or something in the last year or two that's really driven this flip in, in this new distributed architecture? Or is it really just the nature of the internet? Yeah, to me, there was a moment back in time when, around the time when I bought my first uh, iBook, like the, the 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 first laptop from Apple that I bought, right? Like, mm-hmm. and 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 that was sort of like it's a long time ago now, right? Uh, and I started like I I finally bought that after many years with with a Windows machine and back then with the Amiga and so on, right? And then I started noticing sort of at, at tech conferences, at developer conferences and so on, suddenly there you would see like more and more people that had these Apple laptops, right? Um, and that was still at a point where Apple was like was, was, was a very small company compared to Microsoft, right? And, and where Microsoft was extremely dominating in, in, in the whole PC world and everything around that, right? But you started seeing developers sort of gravitating to to towards Apple as a platform. And and I think the same happened when the iPhone came out, right? Like suddenly there was this immense excitement when they when they opened the possibility of writing uh, apps for the iPhone of, of developers really getting excited about it in a way that you never heard any developer be around writing applications for for, for Windows Mobile or, or 
Java applications for the existing, like for Blackberries and so on, right? Like there was just not the excitement around it, right? So I tend to have this belief that that developers are sort of an early indicator, right? Like when they start really, when builders really start getting interested in something, it has this like future effect where once they really start building on top of it, it 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 ends up changing the world in a way, right? Yep. Yep. And, yeah. And in a certain way, that's the feeling I have now around the, uh, and, and what also like drives me to, to, to build Netlify and to invest in this category, right? That there's a shift amongst the people, like amongst the developers, um, that they are really picking up on like, again, if you go to Stack Overflow and, and you check that developer survey, right? Like it's like, more than 70% of developers that would like to like get away from WordPress, right? Like um, we hear the same when, when we talk to developers in like uh, that have to work with like Adobe experience manager, Sitecore or so on. Right. And I think to a large part, it's because they get stuck in like with any of these monolithic systems when they have to work with them as a monolith, that monolithic system determines almost everything around like, what kind of experience do you really get off as a developer? What kind of front end frameworks can you easily work with? How kind, how like, what kind of technologies can you easily incorporate? And a lot of these developers are seeing what's happening in the ecosystem around like front end frameworks and, and uh, Jamstack uh, architecture and like this modern way of building for the web uh, and serverless and so on. And they feel the excitement that they feel the urge to build in that way because it's more fun because the results they can build are more interactive are more engaging and because the friction they experience is 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 much smaller right um and the monolithic platforms as soon as they get they have to work within them they sort of force them into a legacy workflow that feels very foreign right mm-hmm. that feels a bit like if you if if your boss gave you a, a, a windows a machine back in the day when when everybody was starting to adopt uh, Apple and was starting to love like the fact of having a full Linux environment at their hands and so on, right? Like, and um, and I think that that's why I believe that over time, developers gyrating to this and developers the developer adoption and excitement around this way of building will indicate a a, a much longer term shift that 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 we'll only see like once those developers have really built the whole stack around it. Right. Um, and, and I should also say that with all these existing CMS products like WordPress and so on, right. Like as soon as you start using them in, in headless mode, that, that picture changes a lot. Right. And suddenly they, the developers can get really excited about using them again. Right. But it's, it's as soon as you, you go for this full monolithic stack, where parts of it are just moving much slower than the general developer ecosystem, that's when developers get really frustrated, right? And I think once developers start moving in a direction, they will amplify that direction by actually like building stuff on top of it. Yep. Yeah, no, it makes <clears throat> makes perfect sense, and you know, it's the 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 old phrase, you know, follow the money. I think in this case, the analogy is, you know, follow the developer passion, and uh, you know, I, I think you're highlighting, you know, ha- having insight into that passion is. Uh, is really really important, Matt. Thank you so much for the time today. Uh, we really appreciate it. We we always love when when people educate us on stuff that uh, that, that we're hearing a lot about. So um, thank you so much for the time today, um, folks. With that, I'm going to wrap up for Matt and for uh, for Aaron and myself. Um, as always, thank you for listening to the show. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for rating it on iTunes and the other places you get your podcast every week. And with that, we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 